Praise God, this beautiful morning. Several praises I wanted to share. Tom Weaver's MRI is brain tumor. It's smaller. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for the good test results for you, Ruth. Praise God for Stephen Hughes and Judy Bonebride, Barbara Target, and I'd also say for my wife Sandy, um, all good reports of them either overcoming COVID or simply doing well. Metro, I had Colmar had asked for prayer for his pain and he also sent in a good report. And so, several families to keep in prayer during this season. Probably every one of us has been touched by a loss of someone we love and we pray for every one of those beautiful persons within our church and within those online that are watching. Stephen Smith, who is sick today. Anyone else today? A praise or a prayer for someone that's on your heart? Yes, sir. Eric Dahl, he lives in Rattlesboro, Barry. He's going for a mapping of his liver tomorrow for radiation treatment. He has, I think it's stage four, and I believe his liver is very okay. Stage four liver cancer for Larry Goff, and we'll pray for the treatment and what God has for him. Thank you. Chris, uh, Ronnie Maurer will be having surgery on December the 15th uh, to have a stamp put into her uh, abdomen area uh, to remove pain from that, so keep doing that prayers. Yes, especially pray for him. Um, Ronnie Maurer, what a joy she is to us, and pray that God's healing grace and mercy <coughs> would help her and relieve the pain that she's been going through. Anyone else? Grace, I ask for prayer for my brother Russell and his family uh, in Illinois. And Russell, Patty, and family. Uh, Russell is Sandy's youngest brother, who's a minister, and his family. Has COVID and Russell is doing not very well right now. Sending his youngest brother, so <laughs> he's like eight years younger than I am. So keep doing the prayers well. As you prepare for prayer, may God touch our hearts, open the heavens. Put within us those things that we need to hear today. Amen. Sometimes we have a prayer list of those that we are praying for. And others have a prayer list of everyone they're thankful for. As we sing this song, He Touched Me. Can't help but think how long my list is of the people who touched our lives and in a very special place. We continue to worship our Lord and thank Him that He has touched us in a special way. In number 527, we'll sing first and second verse.
presence was definitely felt within all of us, and we really believe in for the power of prayer to change and to heal and to deliver and to make whole. I also know that uh, grateful age of the church for your companions are meeting tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, and they're going to be socially distancing, and during this season, we pray for God's deliverance and protection and mercy for all. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we bow before your throne of grace and may our prayers fill the, the censers of heaven as you release your spirit and power upon the earth. And Lord, as we come together today, we are truly thankful for the many praises that were shared, the many ways you've touched people and have brought healing and grace and mercy. Lord, we pray for your grace and healing mercy to flow like a mighty river upon Stephen Smith. Russell Paddy and his family. Larry Goss. The healing mercy which has continued to be with Mary Johnson. And Lord, we pray for a good report on this successful surgery for our dear sister, Bonnie Mauer. Lord, I pray that your spirit would lead Albert today as he gets the message that you would lead us in song, in worship, in holy communion. For you truly are the God who reaches and touches each one of us. Lord, may we be your hands and feet, surrounded by your glory of Christ who lives within us. Amen. Actually, there's six kings today, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs>
morning. Let us pray. For God and our Heavenly Father, we lift this morning up to you. We ask that you come into our presence. We ask for the power of your Holy Spirit to dwell within us and teach us all things that we can be better disciples and servants of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we empty ourselves to be filled by you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I come to you this morning with a heavy heart. One of the first people that you see on your prayer list this morning, Karen Owens, passed away yesterday and went to see our Lord Jesus. But when I think about Karen, I think about the sermon that I have for you today. It just seems that both fit together. One of the last times I saw Karen was in my driveway in the middle of June. She heard about some people at the anchor house that had children that needed some fishing equipment. And she called me and said, how can I get it there? And she came and brought it to my house, her and Jerry both, and we were able to get those kids the fishing equipment for them to be able to spend time with their families doing that activity. See, that was the epitome of being a servant, of being aware of the people around you and wanting to continue to give, even in a time of uncertainty. In fact, that June day, we stayed our six feet apart and wore masks. But yet the Lord still called Karen home, and we lost a wonderful servant. But as one of my friends shared this morning in our Bible study, in our lives we are like a rock in the water. When you drop a rock in the water, it has a ripple effect. And I want you to realize today, just as we talked about the church in Thessalonica last week, that you all have a ripple effect. Amen. That all of you can touch the lives of somebody around you, whether it's in this building or outside of it. Our main scripture today comes out of the book of Acts in chapter 2. Following the day of Pentecost and the conversion of 5,000 people that gave their life to Christ and were baptized that day. In verse 42 of chapter 2, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property, possessions, to give to anyone who had a need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. What are you devoted to? What is this church devoted to? If you look in your bulletins, you see the word ecclesia. That word means you are the church. This building serves a purpose for a place of fellowship and worship and the hearing of God's Word. There are some here and there are some online. Those that are not here are still the church. They're the church where they're at. Just as you filling the pews here today are the church. 
It is not the building. The building in and of itself is not the entity. The entity is your life in Christ and the ripple effect that you can have on the people around you and in this community. Do you know what the word devoted means? He opens up in verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, the fellowship and the breaking of bread and the prayer. The word devoted here in the Greek means to attend constantly, to keep on or persist, even if it's tough. The English dictionary, quite similar, says to give all or a large part of one's time or resources to a person and or activity. I have the feeling, though, that as I've talked with many pastors, that the church sometimes is more devoted to the activity than the relationship. The church is not devoted to the people. We kind of keep ourselves so busy that we're no heavenly good. When we should be so about the Lord's business that we become earthly good by sharing that message. So in light of that, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. Did you give your 15 minutes of Bible study to God this morning? Or is the sermon today the amount of time that you'll hear about God today? Or maybe it's a Facebook post and you go, oh, that was a good one. I had my God time today. Is that being devoted? Is that really what it means to be devoted to the apostles' teachings? Which was, if you look prior to what he said here in 42, he said that the main message here is that this Christ whom you crucified is both Lord and Messiah. And we have a message to share with our communities that there is hope outside of 2020. There's hope outside of COVID. There's hope in our community that we can share with others if you have the love of Christ in your heart. If you have the love of Christ in your life, you have something to share. Amen. You don't have to live in fear of what's going on out there. Yeah, we can show the respect and wear a mask and provide six feet, but that doesn't keep us from sharing God's word. Amen. And we need to be devoted to the apostles' teachings. What did the apostles teach? If you go back to Matthew chapter 28, he says in the Great Commission, to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. I have a feeling that's what Peter was teaching since he said so just prior in the verses when 5,000 people accepted the Lord that day. But we run to the next basketball game. We run to the next band practice or, or soccer game or basketball game. We run to so many different things. I gotta run to work. That's usually something said in the morning. Bye, honey, I gotta run to work. When are we gonna start running to the Lord? When are we gonna start running to the apostles teaching and taking those teachings with us to work? To share them with the people we encounter whether we're shopping at Walmart or here in the local parks. Maybe it's the people that come for Fort Bologna days. Who knows? You have a message to share, and that's by being devoted to the apostles' teachings. How can you teach something you know nothing about? And if you're not in the Word, how can you know what it's all about? See, I, 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 I'm a martial artist. I'm a fourth degree black belt in Kuso Jitsu, and I could tell you a lot about martial arts today. And I'm sure many of you that have had careers in some industry could tell me a lot about your careers. But I talk to a lot of people that don't know how to share Jesus Christ because he's a Sunday visit. He's just a Sunday reflection. Or maybe it's twice on Sunday, Wednesday, and a Friday night devotional. But are we really devoted to the apostles' teachings? Okay. 
I'm kind of nervous this morning because I have four points. I did the first point in 30 minutes this morning on my Zoom Bible study. <laughs> we could be here a while. <laughs> Matthew chapter 28, I already read. 1 Timothy 4, 11. He says, I command you to teach these things. That was verse 11. I command you and ask you to teach these things. What is it? What is it that we're supposed to, that we're commanded to teach? What is it that we're supposed to share with those that we come in contact with? He says very clearly in verse 1, the Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith. They will follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it was received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and by prayer. If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of the Lord Jesus Christ, nourished on the truth of the faith and the good teachings that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourselves to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the Lord and our living God, who is the Savior of all people, and especially to those who believe. And he concludes it with command and teach these things. That's, yeah, that's what we're supposed to be teaching to people. That's what we should be teaching our congregations, the church, to the church to be the church outside the church. To be out there, to be able to share and labor and strive because we put our hope in the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially all of us who believe. Do you believe? Do you believe? Ask yourself that. Even the demons believe and shudder. But are you laboring and striving because you put your hope in the living God? We should also be devoted to fellowship. I think fellowship is one of the primary things that we've lost in 2020. We've lost the fellowship because some people will take the stance that, well, if I can't be in a church building, then I'll just give it up. And I talked a little bit about that last week. Fellowship is a key and we should not neglect it. In Hebrews 10, 24 through 25, it says, Actually, I'm going to start 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards loving good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. What day? Jesus coming back. And Jesus is coming back. Unfortunately, a lot of times we are not very patient and we kind of get in that mindset, well, maybe he'll be back. Maybe not in my lifetime. And so we start going a different direction and we start listening to the hypocritical liars of this world. Instead of holding unswervingly to the hope we profess, we need to stay in hope for one another. We need to be able to continue to meet together, even if it's six feet apart. Maybe it is through Zoom. Maybe it is through FaceTime. Maybe it's just through a message or a phone call. Yesterday, after Karen passed away, there were text messages and phone calls all over the place of people calling and doing what? Encouraging one another. And helping each other to get through a tough time. People calling and asking for prayer. People looking for encouragement. We're losing people out there and others are running in fear because of it instead of being encouraged. And we can't stop meeting together because that is exactly what Satan wants. 
Satan doesn't want you here. He doesn't want you online. He doesn't want you leaving your house because you're dangerous if you're outside. See, they talk about if we go outside, we're endangering others. No, we're not. You show respect, you wear your mask, you have sanitizer wherever you go, that's fine. You can have your six feet, but you still are outside sharing the gospel of Christ because that's where we should be. That's where we should be. We shouldn't be stuck in our home saying, I can't leave. We need to get out, and we need to start fellowshipping with one another. I'm not saying being careless. I'm not saying don't, don't take this virus seriously. What I am saying is Christ is greater than this virus. Amen. And even though God called home one of his servants yesterday, that woman served to the end. That woman served until her last breath was taken from her. And in the middle of COVID, she was still delivering things to kids in need. Yet we're afraid to leave the house. We're afraid to be part of the community, which is what Christ desires, is for us to have fellowship. So we have to do it differently. So we're six feet apart. Maybe we're on technology like we are this morning with those that are watching online. But I want to challenge those who are online, because I'll tell you, th th this comment on Facebook really bothered me. It's a cold day, I'm going to stay in my pajamas and watch church because I just don't want to get out. Think about that. Think about that statement. I would rather stay in the comforts of my bed than get out and worship the Lord. I'll leave it for you to chew on. In 1 John chapter 1, 1 through 7, it says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, which we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim it to you, the eternal life, which was the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you may also have fellowship have fellowship with us and fellowship with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. Are you joyful? Are you excited about the relationship you have with God today? Are you excited to be able to call and encourage somebody, a brother and sister in Christ, and say, hey, I love you? Hey, I'm there for you? Are you excited? Make your joy complete. And you can't do that if you ignore the fellowship. You can't do that if you're going to separate yourself from what is right. We write this to make our joy complete because we do have a fellowship with God. We have a relationship with God and His Son Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells in each and every one of us. We are God's servants. It's kind of hard to serve when you're not doing it. But as I said last week, find a way to serve. Find a way that you can be a servant for God. You know, I met a gentleman in Seymour. I worked for an oxygen company. And I would deliver oxygen to people's homes who, uh, with COPD and lung diseases and so forth. And I always looked for an opportunity when I was in somebody's home to be able to talk about Christ. And a gentleman I, I met in Seymour, he had a lighthouse. And at the time, I had a youth group, and our group was called Atomic Lighthouse. All teens on Mission for Christ, if I remember that correctly. And so I got to share with him about our youth group. And he says, hold on one second. And he runs into the other room, and he brings out a book to me, a notebook. And he opens it up. He says... I start at 6 o'clock in the morning, and it takes me about an hour and a half. This is my prayer list for all the people I meet. Can I put your name on the last page? And I'm like, please. And he flipped four or five pages, six pages, seven pages deep, and he wrote Albert Storms on his last page underneath the next person he was going to pray for. 
and he's still alive today, and I, and I know he prays for me every single day. He opens up that book and starts from page one, and he's a, what he is, he's a prayer warrior for the Lord, and he prays for all these people. And at the very least, we could be prayer warriors for somebody. At the very least, you could pray for somebody, and that is my third point for this morning, that we need to be devoted to prayer. In Colossians 4, 2 through 6, it says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, Paul says, that God may open a door for our message so that we will proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am changed. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation always be seasoned with salt. So that no one, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Devote yourselves to prayer and being watchful and thankful. When he says this, slightly different than the original, but he talks about the devotion here is continue steadfastly in prayer to endure and to stay in a fixed direction. Andy Stanley says, direction, not intention, determines your destination. If you've ever heard Andy Stanley speak, he'll talk about in his session guardrails about where you're going. Not what you intend to do, but what you are doing. And are you in prayer steadfastly? Are you praying for everyone? Are you praying for your church leaders? Who find it difficult every day wondering if their doors are going to stay open. Finding out whether we're going to have a job tomorrow or not because the government might shut it down. We need to pray, more importantly, for an open door for the message that we proclaim the mystery of Christ to others. In which Paul was in chains. Paul was in prison and he was still sharing the gospel. He couldn't go anywhere. He was in quarantine. He was in quarantine. So what's he doing? He and his brothers and sisters start singing. And later on, the jail shell shakes. Everything falls apart. The guard is ready to kill himself. And instead, by the end of the night, we have a guard and a family being baptized into Christ. All because some men decided to sit in quarantine and praise the Lord. You know, my wife and I were talking about that this morning sometimes. You know, you may find this crazy, but go ahead. But we'll turn on YouTube and start praying, playing praise and worship music in the house. And we'll just stand there in the living room and just praise God. And just sing praises to the Lord. And you're like, what? You, you're just standing there, you and your wife in your living room? Yeah. And we're praising the Lord. And you can have some of the deepest times when you just praise and pray to the Lord and let God lead you in all things. And then you can find out what you're led to do. And you find that you end up having that strength to proclaim it more clearly, as he said in verse 4. And it will challenge you to be wise in how you act towards outsiders. Who are the outsiders? People that don't believe in Christ. Unfortunately, a lot of times we go to work and we act no differently than those we work with. I'm gonna, I'll testify to that. I've, I've fallen into that trap. I have fallen into the trap of going to work and, and wanting to be accepted by my colleagues and maybe not stand my guns. And I've gotten to the point where, I, where, where people will say a cuss word of some sort and they go, oh, we're sorry, Albert. And I'm like, don't say sorry to me. God's in your presence. I'm nothing. You just cussed in front of the Lord. Now that may be kind of bold, but it'll silence the people. It'll silence the, the shameless words, but for me to joke and go, oh yeah, that's fine. That's not representing the Lord. That's me participating in things that I should not participate in in the way I act towards outsiders. We need to make the most of every opportunity, and right now our opportunities are limited. So we need to make use of the opportunities we have to be able to share the message of Christ. Romans 12. <clears throat> he 
He says, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's, share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. That's what Karen did. She shared with people who were in need. You know, I was humbled last week when I came and I saw all the gifts that this church brought for the Leaving the 99. And they were very moved and touched when we presented it to them and loaded up the van on Monday night at Celebrate Recovery in Crothersville. That the people in Bologna thought about that. I thank you for that. I thank you for being servants and letting your hearts speak to being able to show hospitality and love to somebody you don't even know. I thank you. Lastly today, I want to talk about the breaking of bread, which will lead us right into Chris's meditation on communion. To be devoted to breaking of bread. I, I talk with a couple of different pastors in the area, and, and one of the gentlemen that I'm talking with right now, we're talking about table fellowships. Because churches are closing down. But people still need to be able to have a place to talk about the Lord. And so we're discussing having table fellowships where we can get together and break bread. And remember our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, that's what the church originally was. If you go to Acts chapter 20, <clears throat> verses 7 and 8, and it's really a longer reading than what I got for you, but it says, On the first day of the week we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people and became, <clears throat> and because he intended to leave early the next day, he kept on talking till midnight. And there were many lamps in the upstairs room where, where, where they were meeting. You know, and, and if you remember this scripture at all, he talked so long that somebody fell out the window asleep and died. And he went and rose them from the dead. And the next day, when they departed, he was alive and well with his family. But we get upset, like I talked about last week, if we're not out of here by 12.15 or 11.30 to beat the Methodist to the restaurant. You know, guys, can we stay up all night and talk about the Lord? Would you be willing to stay all day and talk about Jesus? These guys, Paul went until midnight. And probably, he I mean, went in at daybreak after uh, the guy fell out the window. I know, Chris, have you had anybody fall off the pew while you were preaching? Maybe pass out? One. One? <laughs> I've yet to have it happen. Don't anybody fall out on me. I don't know what I do. But you know, they came together and broke bread. And that's what they were doing. They met daily and broke bread in Acts chapter 2. They broke bread and gave thanks for the Lord. 1 Corinthians 10, 14 through 17. Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. I'm speaking to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, and we, who are many, are of one body. For we all share the one loaf. I love the cup of thanksgiving. And the bread of life. Because as we get ready to go in this time, we are participating in the life of Christ. Amen. And he says, later on, do this in memory of me. And you know, I believe that partaking of the, of the, of the cup and, and the bread is very important in remembering Christ, but I want you to not miss this point. Christ lived a lot, lived a life, and I think that's what he wants us to really do in memory of him, is to live the way Jesus lived. 
to live the way Jesus lived, and that's what Karen did. She loved people, and she continued to go out and serve people. She continued to do the things God called her to do until he called her home. Are you willing to do the things God has called you to do until he calls you home? Some of us are afraid of being called home. I know I have been for a long time in my life. Actually, I was, I was very afraid of the whole death process until I met this gentleman behind you, Chris Kerminger. He taught me something over a four-day period about what it is to not live in fear. To not live in fear of life. To not live in fear of death. Because we're not here for eternity. We're with Christ for eternity. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. We're on our way to heaven. Why should we be afraid to be called home? So as we get ready to take communion, I'll, I'll leave the rest of this into Chris's hands as he prepares our hearts and minds to receive the body and blood of Christ in a symbolic way of understanding that he gave his life for us and we should be giving our lives for him. Thank you. John chapter 11, we read about Jesus' arrival. That has been dead for four days. And it says, And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them. It says a lot when we have a ministry of comfort. We break bread together and the Holy Spirit comforts us and encourages us. It says in verse 20 of John chapter 11, it says, When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. What does it mean to be devoted to Christ? That's what we heard today. What does it mean to be devoted to Christ? Here's Martha. Maybe she's running with Jesus. Is Mary staying home? And I want you to know that both these women love Jesus with all their heart. Martha looked for comfort in Jesus' presence, and Mary was so overcome with grief, she stayed home. Yet both of them were devoted. It would be real easy to say, well, Martha went to Jesus and Mary didn't. Just like we take the other story in the Bible where Mary was at Jesus' feet listening to his teachings, and Martha was busy preparing things, and Jesus said, well, Mary chose the better part. And somehow we thought, you know, Mary's the ideal, and Martha is the bad example, and yet, it's interesting, the Christians of thousands of years ago would say simply that, a thousand years ago, that Mary represented contemplation on who Christ was and his majesty and beauty, and Martha represents serving, action, faith in action. And here's Martha as the one that's going to Jesus, faith in action. Maybe Mary's staying at home contemplating still. Both devoted to Christ. 
And Martha says to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, but I know that even now God will give whatever you ask. faith that God wants us to have. Amen. When I pray, when I partake of Holy Communion, I thank God for what He's already doing even before it happens. And Jesus says, Martha, your brother will rise again. And Martha says, well, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. There's a blessed hope there. Amen. But Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Mm -hmm. When we come to Holy Communion, we come to meet the risen Savior who is the great I am, Amen. who resurrects the dead things in us to new life who takes our brokenness as his body was broken, as Mary and Martha were broken, even in loss. I'm your comforter and healer. I'm the resurrection of life, Jesus says. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Amen. Maybe I should use a different word because belief is like Christian. The term Christian has fallen on hard time. Do you trust this? Mm -hmm. Do you trust in Jesus and what he says? Because as we enter into Holy Communion, Jesus says, broken, come. Wounded, come. Concerns, come. Joyful and blessed, come. Weak and weary, come. Strong and fulfilled, come. And so as we partake of the body of Christ, the cup of Christ, Lord bless the bread. For Jesus is the living bread of life, eternal life. And bless the cup. For his blood brings forgiveness. And salvation. And healing. Lord, come as we partake. Jennifer plays. Just let God do some surgery on your heart this morning. For you that are online, you can partake of communion at home. Let God do the deeper work in your heart. And when you're ready during this time of
these life affirming words. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. And he rises in our hearts today. And we sing together the first and last stanza of softly and tenderly 934. Let's stand together. And let the risen Lord fill your hearts with praise. Emmanuel, which means God with us. Amen. 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 Celebrate. 